Yes, there we go. I got the Chris look. <laughs> it's identical to the Glenda look. <laughs> well, chapter one, God commissions Joshua and tells him to be strong and courageous. The Hebrew priests, the army, and the general public promise to follow God and Joshua. Chapter 2, we have the story of Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute, who chooses to follow and accept God and is spared. This indicates that God is open to anyone who follows Him. Chapter 3, God gives directions to the people about crossing the Jordan. The moment the priests step into that water, it stops. And the entire mass of people walk across on dry land. Chapter 4, Joshua gives instructions to build a memorial with rocks from the middle of that dry river. And we understand the story of God continues and that we are even now part of that incredible story. Chapter 5, the people follow the laws given at Mount Sinai to purify themselves. They celebrate the Passover and they understand the holiness of God and His purposes. Chapter 6, the Lord gives specific instructions the people follow and the walls of Jericho crumble. Chapter 7, Achan disobeys what God says about not taking anything from Jericho. And when he does, the entire nation is punished. In the first assault on a little bitty community not far from Jericho, they are soundly thrashed. Achan is found out, and because he does not repent, he suffers the consequence of the promise that the army made in chapter 1. Once Israel is obedient and restored, in chapter 8, that little bitty state, city, state of Ai is totally taken care of. This morning, I'm going to ask you, we usually stand for the reading of God's Word, but this morning I want to do the whole chapter. I just can't help it. So if you'll just remain seated, I'm going to break it up, but we'll begin in Joshua chapter 9, verse 1. I will be using the New International Version this morning. Now, when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, after word goes out that little bitty Ai had initially defeated the Hebrews, the rest of the city-states found in Cana felt like they had a chance. You remember, after Jericho, the Bible tells us their hearts had melted. They were terrified. Well, because of the disobedience in the Israel camp, Ai had defeated them, and that gave them hope that they could take Israel out. That first defeat gave the impression that there was a crack in their strength. So all those once upon a time cowering pagans now banded together to war against God's people. Verse 3. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went out as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, we have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. 
nearby was this little place called Gibeon. And instead of joining with the other nations to attack the Hebrews, they decided to attempt to align themselves with the Hebrews. Somehow, they have discovered that the Hebrews will not allow any of the nations to join them. Well, we know, because we have the book, that it was because God told them not to. God didn't want any alignments with these uh, really, really pagan people. And they also knew that Jericho had been completely destroyed and that Ai had been completely destroyed and that on the other side of the Jordan River they had already taken out two whole big city, nation, state peoples. So they come up with a plan of deception. The first thing that might be worth noting is the Israelites had a reputation for having integrity. What a word for us today. If our reputation says we have integrity, people will want to be a part of what we are a part of. And that gives us the opportunity to introduce them or at least talk about our faith and commitment to the Lord and, and to Jesus Christ. Things haven't changed a whole lot, except for maybe electricity and indoor plumbing, which I'm very thankful for, and air conditioning. I've been in Arkansas for a week. Hallelujah for air conditioning. But as far as people's attitudes, they're pretty much the same. So these people knew that if they could get Israel to promise them something, they would keep their promise. And man, they go into a very wily, well thought out plan. These people would have gotten an Emmy for sure. If they can convince Israel they are not from Canaan, and if they can get Israel to make an oath to accept them as slaves, the Gibeonites will be safe. Slavery versus death. Hmm. So these people decide to put their con into action, and they do it well. Verse 7. The Israelites said to the Havites, But perhaps you live near us, so how can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, Who are you, and where do you come from? And they answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. Talk about deception. And you know what? They pull it off completely. Verse 14. The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. The Jews, these group of elders, including Joshua, trusted in their own intelligence. They trusted in their senses. And they trusted in what they were being told. Trusted in their own intelligence. 
trusted in their senses and trusted what they were being told. I think here at this point in the story we can stop and mull that over. I don't know about you all, but I tend to lean into what I know. I tend to believe what I see. And I tend to believe what I hear on a regular basis. I would even have to admit I probably do it more than I'd like to admit. Anybody else ever go there? I want to immediately say in today's world that is dangerous. And it is. But once again, I have to remind us all, including me, that this is an old tactic of the enemy. Satan has been pulling this scam since the Garden of Eden. And here he does it to Joshua and the elders of Israel. And they fall for it hook, line, and sinker. These people, understand, Joshua and these elders are extremely close to the Lord. Joshua has heard the Lord speak to him. Joshua has seen the commander of the angel armies. The elders have crossed the Jordan and stepped over the crumbled walls of Jericho. And here they are deceived. If it can happen to them, then it can happen to us. So, you know me, I go practical. I got to just... We've got to go practical. So, how do we, as followers of the Lord, resist falling for deception? How, how do we risk tripping into being gullible? How, how do we uh, spot, how do we identify when somebody's being dishonest? I think the answer lies in verse 14. Let me read it to you again. The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. I mean, there could be several reasons that this happened. I think sometimes, especially in our world today, I see it here in this text, but I think in our world today, here's a biggie. I think here's a biggie. Here's some protection we can give ourselves. See what you think. Maybe one of the reasons we fall for stuff is because we tend to separate God and God things from our daily lives and, and just how we have to go about living life. That's called compartmentalizing. How did I do that? I've been in Arkansas all week. I wasn't sure that would come out correctly. And, and what that means is that our lives, we, we put our lives into little boxes. Here in this box, I'll put God and God's stuff. And when it's time for God and God's stuff, I'll go there and do God and God's stuff. And then over here, I'll put uh, my marriage. And uh, when it's time to do marriage stuff and be a good wife, um, or <laughs> I'll go over here and... Then when it's time to be a good worker at my job, I'll go over here and I'll be a good worker. And then when it's time to be a good student, I'll go over here and I'll be a... You see? We, we tend to separate things. When we do that, we will tend to use our intelligence. We will tend to use our senses and we will tend to believe what we hear over here in, say, relational stuff or school stuff or work stuff. Instead of having one big box where God permeates all of it. And, you know, I think of these, I uh, think of Joshua and the elders. Man, they got a lot going on. Did you notice what reason could this writer of Joshua possibly had for starting this chapter with all the surrounding armies are gathering together on the horizon and they're going to attack? I don't 
think that's there just because God wanted to hear his head rattle. You see, they had some major things to worry about. They had some major things to prepare for. So it would be really easy to be in war mode instead of God mode. Not sinning, not doing anything wrong. They just separated the two. And because of that, when this little bitty group comes, this little caravan comes riding up, who really cares? I mean, we got, we got armies out here. When we separate the things of our life from God being over it all, we will tend to use our intelligence. We will tend to believe what we hear. We will tend to make decisions based on our feelings. From the beginning of Israel's trek into the promised land, God has said, done, and showed ways to keep him in the center. He has called them and he has called us to keep his presence in our day. He has called us to focus on him. He has called us to look to him even when we're doing other things. And because God knows if we begin to separate him out and put him over here and do God things when it's appropriate, God time at church, you know, teen stuff, la, la, la. <sighs> we'll start having difficulties over here and over here and over here. We see it in the story. We see what happens when Joshua and the leaders make decisions based on material indicators rather than taking the time and effort to seek God and then let him direct them. One of the things uh, Hannah and Emma and I have talked about in recent weeks is how in our busy pace, in our busy life, do we keep God in the center? And, and they're using some things that I think will help them. And we all need those. I mean, I, you know how crazy... It, the, I, for those of you who are visiting this morning, I'm sorry, you don't know how crazy I am yet. Um, but I, I am a pretty scattered person for the most part. So some of the things I do is, I, in my phone, my little ting will go off at 11 o'clock. And I step back and I have something called a breath prayer where I say breath prayer. It takes me 30 seconds, but it refocuses me. At 4 o'clock, ding, I do the glory be because it refocuses me on who's in charge. And, and believe you me, I'm no saint. There won't ever be a Saint Nancy day, I can almost assure you. But I think we can do some things. Um, Emma's personality, Emma, I'm telling on you, and it's really not my sermon, but it's a great example. Emma is, uh, we tried a couple of things and they weren't working at all. Because the reality is what works for me won't work for somebody else. But we found something that's working for her. She found a journal where you doodle. It gives you a verse and then it gives you all these ideas and all these neat little things. And man, she's just... All it's doing is, is keeping God in her focus, keeping God in her lens. Hannah's a story. I gave her one that's stories. She told me this morning, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> so, and if you need ideas, believe you me, I got ideas. I can give you all kinds of ideas. For instance, if you're really a nature person, go for a walk. Just all you got to do is look at one leaf and the intricacy of God is all over the place. I mean, find things that focus you at work. At work. If food is your thing, amen. If food is your thing, when it's time for lunch, say grace. Well, all you've done is refocus yourself. You see how you keep, can keep God uh, doing the big box around all this other stuff? 
And maybe it'll help us inquire of the Lord when it's really important. Even when it may not look important. Because I'm sure this itty-bitty caravan that came traipsing in that had all this moldy bread and their shoes are worn out didn't look too important to Joshua and the elders. Continuing verse 15. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by, oh, three days... After they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that there, they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out and on the third day came to their cities, Gibeon, Kephirah, Biroth, Kiriath, Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly... That's the Israelites. Remember, anybody remember how many soldiers were up front? 40,000. And then regular people behind them. So we're talking a big bunch of people. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders. But all the leaders answered, We have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we will do to them. We will let them live so that God's wrath will not follow on us. For breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, Let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly. So the leader's promise to them was kept. Then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, Why did you deceive us by saying we live a long way from you while actually you live near us? You are now under a curse. You will never be released from service as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, Your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all of its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right to you. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. That day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. We all get to make choices, but we don't get to choose the consequences. Once the Hebrews discover they've been deceived, it causes conflict. The leaders, including Joshua, are questioned. Here's another side note worth remembering. When the people grumble against the elders, notice that the leaders don't defend, they don't blame, they don't talk bad about somebody else, they don't get mad, and they don't get even. They own up to their mistake. What a concept! Boy, what a concept! They take responsibility by keeping integrity. Ooh, there's that word again. They keep their promise to the Gibeonites, even though now it's going to cost them dearly. Now they have a pagan people in their midst with all their pagan practices. Now they are obligated to protect them from all their enemies. On the other side of the coin, the Gibeonites have to also face their consequences. They have agreed to be slaves, because that's actually what the word in the Hebrew means. Boy, here's another story in the book of Joshua that's pretty hard, isn't it? Where's the grace? <laughs> Where's the grace? Well, it's all over the place. First, the Israelites have the grace to keep their integrity. Once they realize their mistake, they decide to keep the promise to these Canaanites, even though it is not a popular decision. And believe you me, making a decision that is not popular takes a whole lot of God's grace. 
Also, there's grace in verse 27. That day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose, and that is what they are to this day. You see, by the Hebrew leaders, by Joshua and the elders, honoring their oath they made with the Gibeonites, those pagan people were put to working right in the middle of worship right in the middle of the place where God was honored, right in the middle of the place where they could hear the stories of God and who God was. And because everyone kept the promises they had made, both the Israelites and the Gibeonites, there were some long-term consequences of grace. Many years down the road, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, who were always off and on, off and on, off and on with God, and believe you me, when they were on with God, they were strong and mighty, and when they were off with God, these people were nuts. They even burned their own children. And so at one of those points, when the Israelite people were at the lowest of the low, and the temple wasn't hardly even being used. The scripture tells us that when another king rose up and he wanted to get back close to the Lord and he wanted the temple cleaned out and he wanted worship restored and they went to do that, guess who they found at the altar of the Lord keeping it up? Guess who they found at the altar of the Lord still worshiping? The Gibeonites. At some point, these pagan people, because God worship and the people of God surrounded them, became believers. They were incorporated into the family of God. And even when, a quote unquote, God's people had deserted him, the Gibeonites remained faithful. God's grace at work through His people practicing integrity, through His people having God as the central focus of everything in their life, through His people being loyal to Him. So I begin to pray. For me, for all of us, Lord, may our promises be strong. May they be unbroken. May our yes be yes and our no be no. God, would you be the center of everything I do, everything I say, everywhere I go? And when that begins to happen in our lives, it may be that people who don't have a clue about God, don't know God and don't really even care, or people who fear God, or people who distrust the church because they've been hurt, might be brought right to the altar, right to the place of worship, and get introduced to a God of incredible grace. Let's pray.